Good morning, brothers and sisters. We have a, God has given us a beautiful day today. We got a little rain last night, and today we got the sun shining so nice. And we must enjoy it while we can, because you know, old man winter is right around the corner. We have a few announcements to make this morning. In your bulletin, you will notice um, number four. Uh, we are very excited to have packed up door hanging bags filled with great controversy books and three ABN cards, Bible study sign-up cards, and a pen. So today is our, our second day of door-to-door uh, -door delivering, and uh, we will have a potluck today uh, for those who are willing and able to come door-to-door uh, -door with us. We will fellowship, then eat together, and then go out into our community uh, and hang bags on neighbor's doors. So if you're willing and able and you want to help us out, we would appreciate it. Also uh, coming up, we have, uh, if you'll notice on number seven, we have some baby dedications coming up. Pastor Tyson will dedicate these four beautiful children to the Lord, and that'll be on September 3rd. It would be Ezra, Jack, Hannah, and Amethyst. And also, coming up on September 10th, we have the uh, Deaconess Ordination. And uh, we'll be celebrating the ordaining of uh, Wendy Dornbush and uh, Courtney Simpson as Deaconesses. So congratulations will be coming to those two. Um, One other thing is um, some of you might be interested in, there's the uh, Minnesota Conference Women's Retreat coming up in November. That's a little ways off yet, but, but it's coming. 
And it's going to be at uh, Craigens Resort in Brainerd. And you, there's a website there where you can get more information. So um, moving right along, we'll, our call to worship today is from uh, Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. It says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. So at this time, uh, uh, Joan and uh, Megan will come up and have our, give our worship and song. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome. Um, just before we start our songs that are selected for Sabbath school today, the verse we're reading, Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And Will was saying how, as he read that scripture, those words, you, know, you say those words, but you can't help it. That, that song just comes to your mind. And you know, of course, you used to sing that well. You know what? It's time to blow some dust off, and we're going to sing that right now spontaneously. And so we'll sing it one time, and then we're going to try it one time as a round, like we used to do in Sabbath school. So, the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice, 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 and again I say. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Not the guys sing it. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. You learn some all day. We're going to sing as we start our song service, number 88. I sing the mighty power of God. stand as we have our opening song, opening hymn, number 86, How Great Thou Art.
<clears throat> one thing the speaker has the privilege of choosing the song. This is my favorite. He just wanted the job on it. This song is so complete in workout. Covers so much territory. Such a blessing. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings of life. We ask that you'll help each one of us <clears throat> to realize how great you are, how you have blessed us. And I pray that you'll be with us today, be with me as I speak. Grant us each one a blessing and a better understanding of your word. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for our focus on mission, uh, Sandy is going to come up and uh, tell us a few things about school and education. Sandy? Well, we've just completed our first week of school. On Monday, we had 12 students. On Tuesday, we had 14. On Wednesday, we had 15. On Thursday and Friday, we had 15. Next week, we're supposed to have one more kindergarten student, so that would give us a total of 16 students. Grandma Sharon has been coming to help us, and uh, Dan has been manning the foyer, and uh, it's been a busy week. Uh, and so I thought I'd just share yesterday, I said to the students, what are some things that you would share that happened this week? So uh, these are some of the things they said. We, complete, we completed our first week of school. There was a goldfinch on our bird feeder. We went for a walk to the pond and saw four ducks. We also saw tree frogs. We celebrated Grandma Sharon's birthday on Thursday. She turned 80. We had donuts, party hats, blowers, and bubbles. We celebrated Matt's birthday on Tuesday. After our walk, we had fruit popsicles. It was so hot, they tasted so good. We learned that any number to the power of zero equals one. Quante learned how to write numbers in expanded form. We practiced our safety drills. We made cards for several people. We learned the correct way to say uh, a flower, which is called a kolonkoi. kolonkoi. Uh, I've been saying kolancho for I don't know how many years, but it's a kolonkoi. A uh, beautiful flower that Dave uh, brought on behalf of Home and School on Monday. We learned about a part of our brain called the amygdala, and we found a dragonfly in the bird bath and a spider in a pitcher. <laughs> so, <laughs> pulled out a pitcher and started filling it with water and said, oh! <laughs> anyway, but we had a fun, busy week. We're looking forward to many, many more. And uh, if any of you have uh, something that you would like to come and share at school, maybe a special skill or a hobby of yours, please let me know. Um, we'd, we'd love to have you come and present. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your uh, support of the school. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Our scripture reading for today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 20 and 21. Verse 20, Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now at this time, we'll have our prayer. And I want to ask if there is any unspoken requests. Okay, I see a bunch of hands go up. So...
If, uh, if able, if you can kneel, please kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege to worship you in your house. Thank you for being our creator and for everything you created in the universe. It's just marvelous to know how you made the earth rotate on its axis and for the earth and the moon to revolve around the sun. And for all of those who have indicated they have unspoken requests and all those on our prayer list, we pray that you bring healing, comfort, and peace to all of them. Lord, we pray for our nation and for our leaders that they make good decisions. Thank you for our religious freedoms we have, for our church, our school, and our teachers who give their all to the children. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So let your light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And Father, we ask that you be with Richard as he brings his message to us this morning. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. At this time, we will have our stewardship and offering. Today's offering I think I read it on here. It was Well, I'm not seeing it here, but anyway. Many of you know the story of Zacchaeus in the New Testament. It presents a giving the result of true spiritual revival. Before welcoming Jesus as his guest of honor, Zacchaeus was the greediest man in Jericho. He was ready to betray his friends his country, forsake his religion, and sacrifice his reputation for just a little more. However, when salvation entered his house, he was prompted to give more than what he owed. I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. That was his love response to the love he received from Jesus. We can give without loving, but we cannot love without giving. The call for a spiritual revival is resounding loud in our churches. This week, as we worship with our tithe and regular offerings, which show that the revival message has taken root in our hearts. At this time, the deacons will come to receive the offering.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, at this time, we'll, we'll have our children's story. Morning, boys and girls. I'm going to tell you a story about the same little lamb that I've told you about three times. Or two times. This will be the third time. And this will be the last time. For those of you who weren't here the first time, I had this little lamb that broke both hind legs at the same time. You think a lamb can walk on two legs? No. I had to at least get three legs going for that lamb to walk. And then she became paralyzed. Couldn't walk at all. Couldn't get up. Couldn't move. That was the second story I told you. And I made Calvin look bad in that story, so I got to correct that one. Remember Calvin told me to go and shoot it. You would never get up. Which was good advice, because 99.99% of the time you wouldn't get up. But I forgot something that I had done. I had prayed for that little lamb. Poor Calvin, he didn't know that. So when he told me that lamb would never get up and go home and shoot it, I just couldn't shoot that little lamb. So I kept fed that little lamb and cared for that little lamb and watered that little lamb. And one day that little lamb started to crawl a little bit. Probably a month later. But being God didn't answer my prayer when I asked for it, I gave up on God. But now if we remember, oh, I prayed for that little lamb. So never give up. Even if God doesn't answer your prayer right away, He will answer it in His time. So don't give up. You can go back to your seats now. I just wanted to tell you real quick, I, I, earlier I lost my place on the bulletin and I couldn't find what today's offering was for, but I just now found it. It was for Minnesota Advance, so in case any of you were wondering. So I um, must be having one of those senior moments. <laughs> but right at this time, um, Megan is going to do our special music. Megan. Oh, 
Megan. I'm having trouble with my voice this morning. I had to go out and get a drink of water. See if I can find my notes here. You probably look at the title. What kind of a title is that? To be quite frank with you, I didn't have the title ready when I gave uh, Diana the, my schedule and such. So I had to quick think up one. The title, the importance of it is, who said that? It doesn't really matter what I say or isn't really official. But when God says something, we need to listen. And that's where I hope to go with my sermon here. My voice will hold up. <laughs> Usually I don't have trouble in the morning. <clears throat> in the afternoon I get to where I can hardly talk sometimes. You know, before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I pray to you that you will be with us, guide and direct. Help me, Lord, convey your message here to draw people closer to you, to help them, each one of us to understand you, to be ready when you come, that we might all have a home with you in your kingdom. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, <coughs> I'm going to start out with a little bit of my background so that you can sort of maybe understand better where I'm coming from. I grew up in North Dakota, out in the Moondock, on the west, the Missouri River bordered us, and on the south was South Dakota. <clears throat> We're right in the corner, just totally ignored. Our roads consisted of two wheel tracks. And when we wore those two wheel tracks down the deep, and then we would make, move over and make two more wheel tracks. I was as naive as naive can get about God. I've got quite a bit of time today, but I better not make it too long or I'll uh, lose my voice. <laughs> and I think back and I can see where God was leading me. From the time I was five years old, what he had to say to me, I don't know. But I recognized there was somebody pulling the string. Somebody pulling on my heart. 
<laughs> I'll say that was my first encounter. And I don't know what it's all about. I think it was about my grandma's sperm. I had a grandma that was an administration lady. She died when I was about 10 years old. Don't remember much about her. But I look back and I think, she must have been praying for me. And that was the Holy Spirit answering her prayer, touching me. I didn't know who God was. I didn't know anything about him. But I think that affected my life. Later on, my cousins, who were six, seven years old then, told me, if I told a lie, I was going to burn in hell forever. That's my second encounter of mine. That made an honest little boy out of me. I didn't want to burn in hell forever. Not that I knew much about God. I didn't want to burn in hell forever. But I still remember that. I can take you with a hundred feet of where they told me that. The reason I know the year is because we live. I know where we live. Then a little later in life, uh, in school, there was a Catholic boy, and we were really divided at that time. Catholics were this way, and the rest of us were that way. And now this Catholic family moved into our area, and he accused one of the kids there in my grade. He knew didn't even know what the color of the Bible is. I was so embarrassed. I had no clue what color the Bible was. So embarrassed. Why was I embarrassed? Because I felt stupid. That's how naive I was. A couple years later, they started a Sunday school class. First of all, we lived 25 miles from town. Nobody went to church except the Catholics, which had a church in the country. Nobody else went to church. The only time I heard God's name mentioned was when they told me I was going to burn in hell forever or when the men took it in vain. And the women got together and decided to have a Sunday school class. We had it in the schoolhouse and we'd only have it three months in a year. The teacher boarded, lived in the schoolhouse during the school time. So we did this for a year or so. And then somebody invited a pastor to come from 25 miles out to our church, told him about the Sunday school class we were having, and he shows up. And this is where it starts to get interesting, I, as I recall. One of the first sermons he preached, remember, I had never seen a pastor before that I can remember. But I actually had, I'd seen a pastor two times, two funerals. And I can't remember a word they said, nor what they looked like. I wasn't interested in it at that time. I was a happy kid, enjoying life to the fullest. I had no need of interruption. So evidently I didn't pay attention. And then when this pastor came, he held up his Bible and said, this is God's word. Remember, I've been taking Sunday school lessons for a year and a half or so, during the summertime. And I can remember my thoughts. He said, this is God's word, we abide by it. And I remember my thoughts. I thought, well, if that's God's word, and we, why wouldn't we abide by it? If God is who you say here, I mean, that's my thought. And that is not with me. About a year later, remember, he had three months to preach. Three months and the whole year to preach. And he started preaching on the Ten Commandments. I realized he preached on one. First one, one Sunday, second one the next Sunday, third one the next Sunday, 
He was going to spend the whole year preaching on the Ten Commandments. Nothing wrong with that. But I want you to tuck that back in your memory. He got to the Fourth Commandment, and somebody in the crowd, it's sort of informal, somebody spoke up, hey, we're in school, remember, hey, isn't Saturday the Sabbath? Remember, this is God's word we abide by, and I expected him to abide by it. <clears throat> he made so many excuses, I was embarrassed for him. Remember I said, this is God's word, and I thought we ought to abide by it. Now something comes along that I wasn't real happy with. I need to look at that. What did I do? I went and I got a Bible and I started reading. The first I met with him after that, and I asked him about this. I didn't quite get it. He didn't believe uh, didn't accept the Bible Sabbath before and he find it was changed, but he couldn't. So I got my Bible and I read from Genesis to Revelation, trying to find that change. I just could not come to grips with. Everybody was wrong. That was just could not come to grips with that. But he also couldn't let it go. If God said no, who am I to ignore it? That was my thought. Remember, I said I was a happy kid. I was totally happy in life. I was not interested in having this come into my life and upset everything I was doing. I fought on every inch of the way. But I opened God's word. And that was my guide. And that's why I'm here where I am today. God has blessed me. I acknowledge that. God has blessed me with understanding. And he's also laid a burden upon my heart. He did not bless me that I can put it under a bushel basket. I know how bad I sound. I've heard myself. See, when I talk, I'm, I'm normal. But when I hear it over that, and I apologize to you for half the lesson of that. But God has laid a burden on me to share what he's shown me. And that's why I'm up here. And you thought this we what if God had blessed me with well, the ability to think. Can't imagine. That door would be damned, you guys didn't leave it with my voice the way it is. I apologize for my voice. But God has laid a burden on me to share. God has called me to follow. I've had to make a lot of changes in my life as I accepted that. Now back to my text for today. In Matthew chapter 7. I love Matthew 7. Jesus tells us so much in here. He compares how he loves, he wants to give us good gifts more than we want to give good gifts to our children. I'm up here to share with you some things I think we're missing. Matthew 7, verses 20 and 21. 
my Bible I have the uh, red letter edition. All but two verses in seven are red. This means this is what Jesus said. If Jesus said it, we need to listen. Not we should listen. We need to listen. If we plan on going to heaven with Jesus, we need to listen. He says, every tree that bringeth forth good fruit is hewn, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruit shall be ye be known, be known of them. <clears throat> well, let me go back to verse 13. Enter ye in at the street gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the gate, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This sounds like a downplay. Why did Jesus make a statement like that? He's trying to save us. He's warning us. Don't be careless. You're not just going to walk in and you'll find yourself in heaven someday. You need to search. You need to pay attention. Verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will he, I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that were iniquity. What a solemn statement by Jesus himself. You notice these people were arguing with him. Didn't I do what you asked me to do? We need to be willing to follow Jesus. How do we do that? I will address that a little later. The last statement I read, I believe Jesus is calling us to pay attention. If we don't pay attention, how can God lead us? There's a part that I think sometimes we forget about God. God gives us blessings. He says he gives some teachers, some pastors. He gives some the ability to sing. He gives us all different gifts. But there's one gift that God gives every one of us. Every one of us. You know what that is? The gift of freedom of choice. And that gift is so central to our life, you can't imagine. You see, when our children grew up, as they got older, we let them make their own choice. 
even though we didn't like it. There come a time when we let them make their own choices. You know what happened to those children when they were given that freedom? They owned that choice. A serious matter. They own that choice. And the same with us. When we make our choices, we own it. Now the theory part. Did you realize God's not going to take that choice away from you? He gave it to you. He's not going to take it away from you. And I'm going to draw your attention to the flood. There's so much we can learn from the flood. Genesis chapter 10. Seventeen. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Can you get that? I, God, I will bring a flood. But let's look at that. Okay. Does that mean they all had to die? No. Why? Because he had prepared an ark for them. He prepared a boat. What was their responsibility? To get in the boat. They didn't have to drown. They just needed to get in the boat. And that's with us. We don't have to lose honor in heaven. We just got to get on board. It depends on how you look at things. If you look at it through little tiny people, you might miss the whole point. But if you look at the whole thing, God provided them a way out. There are several lessons in this here that I find interesting. When this flood came, you need to realize there had never been a rain before. The water, the earth was watered by dew. They had never seen a rain. They had never seen a flood. They had no idea. But God spent 120 years with Noah telling him about the flood. There's nothing he didn't know about. It. But pay attention. When the flood came, did God get up on the ark or send an angel to get up on the ark and shout, Hey, there's a flood coming. No. God was totally silent about it. Why? God could have sent a big old thunderstorm, a hard downpour, a rain. You think that would have changed some people's Mine? I think that boat would have been formed. Why didn't God do that? He wants to save people. And we'll address that toward, uh, toward the end. God wants to save people. That's why he prepared the boat. I think we like to blame the devil for that. God said, I, even I only, did this flood. Did the devil have part in that? Oh, I believe so much of a part in that. In what caused it. But I can almost hear the devil you know, shouting, Alas, alas, God, I almost had him. He had everybody deceived except eight people. Why didn't God send the flood? Warn him. He would have been interfering with their freedom of choice. Wouldn't it be? He wouldn't. Have. He wouldn't have been interfering with their freedom of choice. Dad. 
But God didn't leave him without knowing. Remember, he sent in seven chickens with two flocks. He sent in seven sheep with two wolves. He sent in seven deer with two lions. You get the picture? When they saw that happening, where was their mind? It seemed to me they should have gone on board. Entered the boat. Seen these animals. And remember, they knew at the time which animals were clean and which were not clean. Seven clean went in, two unclean went in. That should have caught anybody's attention. This is one of the strongest indications we have that God will not interfere with our choice. Along with Eve. Remember when Eve went to that tree, which God had warned her not to go to, you'd think he'd have sent an angel down there, at least say, hey Eve! But he didn't. Had he done that, he would have been interfering with Eve's choice. That's why I stress the importance of freedom of choice to us to realize that. We need to pay attention. God is not going to save anybody, I don't believe, against their wishes. I've always said, God is not going to drag anybody into heaven kicking and screaming. We need to make that decision on our own. And I'll address that later. I've enjoyed life. I've enjoyed my decision that I made. I made a lot of changes. I grew up enjoying life. In fact, let me tell you a story about that. How stupid I was. One of the funerals I went to, my mom actually, actually had to tell me, you're at a funeral, stop having so much fun. I was like full of fun. I enjoyed fun. I enjoyed a good time. But this is one of the best things I've ever done. The biggest fulfillment of life I've had is giving my life to Jesus. And that's the most important thing we any of us can do. To surrender our life and let God lead. And this is where our role comes in. God is more anxious to save us, and I've said this many, many times. You know, I'm about end, ready to end my sermon. God has said, I've said many, many times. We need to pay attention. God wants to save us. The thing that stands in the road most of the time is the freedom, our freedom, of choice. Sin is not going to enter heaven the second time we're told. How can we get into heaven as sinners unless we're changed? If God is not going to change us unless we ask him to change us, then the ball is in our court. Remember, Jesus paid the price. It's like he has a ticket there. To hand us to go into heaven. We have to choose to take it. He's not going to force us. 
We need to be changed before we enter heaven. That's an absolute, I believe. We need to be changed. The only way that's going to happen is we surrender to God and let him do it. Remember, he wants to do it. How do I know this? You think Jesus would have died for us and he didn't want to save us? You think that true? Jesus died. And we take that too lightly. I used to look at that and say, you know, when he was suffering, my death, bring it on. Get me out of this world, this earth. Until I read a quote from Ellen White. Set me on my heel. He said, Jesus could not be beyond the cross and he was going to be saved. That is mind shaking. When I read that, the first thing I did, what I did, went to the Bible. She quoted the text that she was using. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had pulled back from Jesus according to this, and he went to the cross. He could not see beyond the cross for sure that his sacrifice was going to be accepted, and that is absolutely mind-boggling. When we realize that, what a price Jesus has paid for us. Everything he said, everything he's done, is trying to prepare us for heaven. How are we going to respond? That's our decision. That's our part. It is very simple, but yet it's complicated. It's surrender. Surrender our life, then Jesus might change us. That we might have a home with him. A home that we can't even imagine. We look at the Garden of Eden before sin came in. What a pleasant place to be. And I think it's going to be greater. And it's all been paid for. It's all waiting for us. But we need to surrender and let Jesus take care of us and prepare us for that. We'll close the thing number 573. I will go where you want me to go. I will say what you want me to say. I will do what you want me to do. If only I could live up to that. Thank you.
Lord, help us, each one of us, that we'll do what you want us to do. And just we'll say what you want us to say. That we'll be your servants. That we may gladly follow you. That we may have a home with you someday, each one of us. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.